<laughs> Curiosity. It's at the heart of human nature. Adam and Eve just couldn't not bite that apple. <laughs> and we've been exploring ever since. Today's talk is about curiosity. So let's look at the curiosity of immigrants in this country and how it's made America strong. Unless you're a Native American, every one of you came from someplace else. Raise your hand if you're an immigrant. Raise your hand if your parents were immigrants. Raise your hand if your grandparents were immigrants. Essentially, every one of you came from someplace else. And that's what's made America strong and vibrant. I'm going to start with talking about a particular American immigrant. Abdul Jindali came from Syria, the city of Homs, which has now been destroyed by the Syrian civil war. His curiosity drove him to study in Beirut. And there he got involved in protests, even spent three days in jail, and those protests eventually led him to flee. And he came to the United States, here in New York, to study at Columbia University. He then went on to Wisconsin, got a PhD, eventually went into the restaurant business. The typical immigrant, he's now 85, lives in Nevada, has two successful children. It's part of the American dream. Let me focus on one of his two children. In 1955, he and his then girlfriend had a son. They gave that son up for adoption and that son ended up growing up in Los Altos, California. He was a curious young boy. And at age 12, he liked to tinker with machines. And he was trying to build a frequency counter, but he didn't have the parts. And he did something that probably no University of Rochester student today has ever done. He went to the phone book, picked up that big book, and looked up the number for Hewlett Packard, and asked to speak to the CEO of Hewlett Packard. And he did, for 20 minutes. And he not only got those parts, he got a job at Hewlett Packard for the summer. <laughs> Now, you may have guessed it today, but that young boy grew up to found Apple. Steve Jobs is the son of that Syrian immigrant. And he's probably the most curious man of our time. Now, what does this story have to do with our talk today about curiosity and immigrant strength? Absolutely everything. Today, 40 million Americans are immigrants first-born immigrants. That's 12% of our population. They come here for different reasons. Some come for opportunity, others are fleeing war. And usually the United States had something to do with those conflicts. Look at today. Tens of thousands of undocumented migrant children are fleeing the drug-fueled violence in Central America. Think about the next time you see somebody buying drugs. Americans buy those drugs and fuel that violence. So we have a role there. I mentioned Syria, 10,000 immigrants have come as refugees fleeing that bloody conflict. Millions more want to come. And we have 11 million undocumented migrants. Vietnam, everyone knows Vietnam. We just elected in Florida, where I now live, a Vietnam refugee to Congress, largely because the Vietnam vets in her district were proud that she had succeeded. I now teach at a state university in Florida. I have refugee students from Bosnia, Afghanistan, Iraq, all conflicts that the United States had a role in. So why do we let these immigrants in? We don't have to. It's because they're the economic drivers of our country. They work hard, they pay taxes, they buy homes, and they fuel our economy. Think for a minute about that Steve Jobs and just take out your cell phones, which I know you never put down anyway, and say thank you to Steve Jobs. <laughs> 
but also say thank you to our immigration system because today if we had a Abdul Jindali asking for a visa from Syria we would say no and that's just wrong if we had not had our immigration in place at the time when Abdul Jindali Steve Jobs never would have created Apple you'd still be using these flip phones because make no mistake about it, there is no way Steve Jobs could have created Apple in Syria. And he's no exception. Look at the genius of the immigrants who have built this country. Albert Einstein, Andrew Carnegie of US Steel, Sergey Brin of Google. Now you're college students, you probably are familiar with many of the companies created by immigrants or their children. Budweiser Beer, Home Depot, eBay, McDonald's, even Walt Disney, all created by immigrants or their children. The most successful companies in this, in the world are the Fortune 500 companies. 40% of the Fortune 500 companies were created by immigrants or their children. I mentioned before that immigrants were 12% of our population and yet they're 40% of the Fortune 500s. That means that immigrants and their children are more curious, they work hard, have a harder drive than the children several generations removed from immigration. So think about that. Immigrants, Fortune 500 create wealth of two trillion dollars to our economy. That's greater than the wealth of every country in the world except China and India. And what that means is that the curiosity of those immigrants drive our economy. They ask, they work hard. So why would we not let them in? I've lived in Washington for decades and I have never seen an environment so toxic. Politicians are getting elected scapegoating immigrants and that is downright un-American. If you look at immigration today, we have suspended immigration from six Muslim countries, Iran, Iraq, Somalia, Sudan, Yemen, and yes, Syria. And we're trying to kick out the 11 million docu undocumented workers, most of whom have lived here all of their lives. Discrimination has always been part of the American fabric, and it's always been wrong. A century ago, it was the Irish that were told don't bother applying for a job. Italians and Poles and other Europeans were discriminated against harshly. So the faces of those immigrants change, but the discrimination does not. Now, if an adult came here and broke our laws, they can't get a free pass, everybody gets that. But we need a new immigration system that reflects reality, our values, and practicality, and that means making sure that we, yes, secure our borders, but in a way that makes sense to the threat. And that we have an immigration system that makes businesses and individuals play by the rules. Because America has to stay the magnet for those youth who come in and drive our economy. I want young, curious immigrants driving our economy. That is the strength of American society. That conversation on immigration can't happen unless Americans understand their place in the world. Take a look at this map. Unfortunately, that really is how most Americans see the world. Now take a look at how the world really looks. Look at all those lights around the country and look at the areas that are not let yet, yet lit. The United States has 322 million people in it, but the rest of that world, seven billion people more. And another two billion are gonna come on Earth by the year 2050, which means by the middle of this century, there'll be almost 10 billion people on this Earth, and the United States will be 3%. So think globally as you decide your career Think about not just trying to sell to people here in New York or in the United States, but the 97% of the community that's gonna live outside of the world. 
We want to manage globalization, not close up our borders and end our trade. Because our prosperity depends on creating businesses to the rest of the world. Our exports are 14% of our gross domestic product. Think about what would happen if you could sell to the rest of the world. You'd be very wealthy and you could come back here and endow a building <laughs> in your name. You can't do it just selling in the United States anymore. I want to start a new conversation. One where the world, north, south, east, and west come together and understand that we're all part of the same struggle. We all live on the same earth and we all must work together. It's a simple though not easy way to address the conflicts that you see around the world. I call it the new global compact and it can revolutionize the 21st century. It requires that the haves and the have not see that each other's struggles must be solved for both of them to be prosperous. Let me illustrate. The billions of poor people on the world, they're not worried about cyber attacks or Al-Qaeda or terrorism. They're afraid of not having enough to eat, not having clean water, war that will kill them. But they want the exact same thing you do, a good life, a nice home, a good education and a future for their children. And we, the rich people, we have our fears. We don't worry about eating. We do worry about terrorism, cybercrime, infectious diseases, environmental degradation, but we want the exact same thing. We want a nice home, a good education, and a better future for our children. So I want to see a world where the haves and the have-nots recognize that we're all part of the same conflict. That we can't be safe and prosperous if the other half is not. To do so requires strong US leadership and an understanding by all of you and your generation of America's place in the world. For when the United States fails to lead, the solutions are generally not in our interest and harm the other half of the world. Let me illustrate one of the starkest conflicts. The Democratic Republic is in the heart of Africa. And it's the world's deadliest conflict. Millions of people had died, have died in decades of a brutal civil war. And in fact, the immigrants that we took the most nation from last year was the Democratic Republic of the Congo, 16,000 of them. What does this have to do with you? Take that cell phone out again and look at it and recognize that it contains cobalt that in all likelihood came from the Congo. It's the world's source of cobalt which everybody uses to make those cell phones. So you too are participating in this conflict. Think about that. This is a family I know that lives in the Congo. Adelard and his family want the same thing you do. They want a nice house, a nice garden, a good job, and a better life for the children. And yet, they live in fear that the war is going to be resumed and the rebels will destroy their village. And yet, believe it or not, we need their help in fighting terrorism because Boko Haram, ISIS, Al-Qaeda all have roots in Africa. And we can't be safe if they don't help us. Because as the lone superpower, the United States is the one that has a target on its back. So we need a world where we recognize that unless the US helps the other half live, we will never be safe. Now, here's a statistic that gives me great concern. This is the eight richest men on earth, and yes, they're all men. Combined, they own more wealth than 3.6 billion people, nearly half of the world. And that is just wrong. And don't make the mistake of thinking that the other half doesn't know how the rich half lives. They do. And they will fight for prosperity. And if they can't achieve it, they're going to become recruits for Al-Qaeda, terrorists, drug lords that threaten, yes, us. <laughs> 
So that brings me back to the new global compact. As you prepare to graduate, understand America's role in the world. 3% of the global population by the time you reach middle age. So why wouldn't we have a global workforce? Why wouldn't we think globally? Be part of the new conversation to recognize that we are all part of the same struggle and all part of the same earth. Promote tolerance. Turn off the TV, talk to people, or at least change the channel and change the conversation. End the intolerance that's growing up in our country and the bickering. Start a new conversation. Recognize that it's the curiosity of immigrants that make this country strong. Think and act globally. Remember Steve Jobs' question to the head of CEO and ask. And let your curiosity drive your life, because if you do, you can truly change the world. Thank you.